A show that tackles the big issues affecting the BVI and the rest of the Caribbean. Searches for answers to today's big questions and gives viewers a unique perspective on developing stories. Follow the big story with me, Kathy Richards, only on JTV. This show is brought to you by the National Bank of the Virgin Islands, Cyril B. Romney Tertola Pier Park, Envy Salon Spa Nail and Barbershop, the Wellness Center, Medical and Behavioral Health Clinics, Tissily Cross Deliciously Smooth Cider, HOV Medical and Digicel, Simply More Speed, Reliability and Entertainment. This is The Big Story. I'm Kathy Richards. I want to thank you so much for joining us for this edition. With me on set today is our Minister for Education, Youth Affairs and Sports, Honorable Cherie B. De Castro. Uh, four years later. Yes, yes. <laughs> four years later. I want to welcome you to The Big Story. We are in uh, that season again. Uh, we saw you made it into government at the 2019 elections. Uh, we want to first go back to that that moment uh, and uh, where you see yourself today. Uh, so it was a humbling moment. Uh, in 2019, after the Virgin Islands Party government would have been successful at the polls, it really, uh, I believe, catapulted uh, myself into a journey um, of leadership. And it really has been a learning experience over the last four years. Um, being new uh, to government, having to understand the system, the structures, the processes, uh, and really navigating them to be able to bring forward change for the people of these Virgin Islands uh, has been uh, a tremendous journey for me. And I appreciate uh, the people of the Virgin Islands giving me the opportunity. And of course, we're here once again to ask them to consider giving me another chance to continue uh, bringing forth change in these Virgin Islands. Okay, so we want to talk a bit about what what would be those factors that would uh, make you bold enough to say, give us another chance uh, because we can do this job. I remember you would have started out uh, for the first uh, three years in, in government as a backbencher, as we would commonly say, but also as a junior minister, yes. and that was for tourism, right? You started First trade and then tourism. So, yeah, so let's go through those two junior positions. Uh, uh, what it is that you would have... Uh, what have you seen or experienced and learned in, firstly, the junior minister of trade position? Uh, the junior minister of trade position, um, it was new. Um, and I was able to get into that post um, surrounded by persons who have significant experience in the field. And what we really uh, sought to do initially is see how especially we could uh, build small businesses and create opportunities for innovation. Uh, and we hosted a few events. Uh, we had a series of, of programming to seek to support that initiative. And then, of course, transitioning into the Junior Minister of Tourism role, uh, we did a lot regarding branding uh, and marketing and seeking to see how we could uh, really revitalize our product offerings. Uh, we went to numerous uh, shows, uh, traveled, we won awards. Uh, and I believe we're still on the path to really are reconsidering and re revitalizing our product and of course that takes time but most importantly I think we have to really uh, become a lot more innovative in our approach and I believe that we are well on our way. Uh, it takes a lot more initiative, um, grit and determination to get there but I believe we have everything within us as Virgin Islanders uh, to really continue to grow and develop our tourism product. What are some of those factors that would have uh, caused you to realize that, look, oh, we, need to, we need to be a little more innovative and look at our approaches? Well, I mean, everywhere has sun, sun and sea. And I think, you know, our cultural identity, who we are as a people, um, and innately we are an entrepreneurial, uh, innovative uh, individuals because you know I, I think it's in our blood it's in our DNA and I think with more access to opportunity uh, and potential funding uh, there is a reality that we can continue to develop I think we have to systematically create more structures and systems though to be able to support uh, those types of initiatives and of course you would have heard me say before that even in the junior minister roles uh, we have to cement a structure a system 
uh, responsibility so that the junior ministers could be more effective. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was one of the most disappointing experiences of the journey. And we worked assiduously uh, to see how we could remedy it. Um, I believe there's still a lot more work to be done uh, because I believe that all 13 individuals in the House of Assembly should be able to effectively and adequately use their experience and expertise to the betterment of the territory. I believe the current systems and structure uh, does not always give that opportunity to junior ministers or backbenchers and I believe we have to do a lot more systematically to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to do what the people put them there to do which mm -hmm. is to serve. What were some of those roadblocks that you met uh, as a result of, of not having proper structures and, and policies and places to guide mode of operandi for uh, junior ministers? Well really I think the expectations of persons and truthfully even the expectations of myself um, would have been significantly challenged because you know you go in you're young you're excited uh, you're ready uh, but the system does not allow an avenue for you to have the level of access and the level of opportunity and authority uh, to be able to move things forward and I think we have to seriously reconsider it as I stated before and I believe that ultimately it would be to the benefit of all um, as a team uh, to be able to flesh out responsibilities and roles. I don't believe you should have to be a minister to be able to get things done. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fundamentally flawed perception. And I believe as we grow our democracy, as we grow our system and our governance, we have to take those things into consideration. Mm -hmm. What were some of those baby steps that you would have seen that, that is leading towards getting that streamlined? So I believe um, we would have been in a position over time um, after a lot of dialogue and conversation uh, to see uh, some things put in writing uh, to be able to lend some legitimacy to the role. I think we need to really formalize it a lot more. But really, I think more than anything else, it would have been uh, the innate drive of both myself and Honorable Flex Charles, who would have sat in, in those seats, at least initially, um, to just try to, outside of the reality of uh, what we faced, still try to see how we could help people. Um, of course, I don't believe it should remain like that, but uh, I think systematically we have to relook, even in the Constitution, how it is uh, formatted and how it is phrased and really flesh it out a bit more in terms of the level of responsibility that the junior ministers will have. Mm. Uh, you became the very first, uh, yes, you were the, for the youngest uh, person to have have entered into government uh, when you were elected in 2019. And more than that, you were a woman, yes. uh, a young woman. Yes. How challenging has that been, being with more uh, persons who are more grown than you, more seasoned than you, uh, in getting what you really wanted to do? So I think uh, that has been quite a journey, and I'm going to be very honest and upfront about it. Uh, it's it's. I know who I am, right? And I believe that I understand my purpose and my singular aim is to make a difference. I said that from Ms. BVI and I'll repeat it now. And I believe my interest in education and youth development, it really has been my platform all my life in every facet of every opportunity that I've taken. And as a young person, when you understand uh, who you are, and it innately is really because of my relationship with God, my belief in God, and my willingness to be a vehicle uh, for change and it has been challenging of course because you know persons seem to ascribe certain things to you you know you're too young you have time and I categorically disagree with that we don't know how long our dash is between when we were born and when we will die and so to conceptualize and say that I have time um, I don't believe it to be true in, in essence because none of us know the day mm -hmm. um, when our time will expire. And I believe in using every single second of every single day uh, to be impactful and to create change. So I believe that stigma has to change. Mm -hmm. um, I believe experience is important, but as a young person, how do you get experience if you don't get your feet wet and if you don't get a seat at the table. And as a female as well, of course, there are different connotations that persons seek to attach to you. Uh, when you become passionate, it may more be considered as being emotional. But I believe that there is uh, room for balance uh, in leadership. I believe in leadership, your leaders should reflect your population. 
So you should have young people, you should have women, you should have men, young men, you should have a vast uh, range, range mm -hmm. right, of expertise, of individuals, of age groups. And I think that we have to do more uh, to make that a reality in the Virgin Islands. And I'm just happy that I got the opportunity to be a part of it. Of course, you have to naturally be forceful. Mm -hmm. um, some people uh, categorize that as aggression. Um, but for me, it's not that, you know, um, sitting in the seat as the Minister of Education, as an example, uh, I know I had limited time and every single second of every single day was important to me. And so the clock that maybe others were on, it wasn't the clock that I was on. And I wanted to be able to realize some sort of change because we understood that it was necessary. And as we sought to reimagine education, the approach that we took was one of inclusion and one that allowed me to really be a part of a change that I'm grateful that the teachers, the principals, the education officers, the entire Ministry of Education would have allowed me the opportunity to lead despite what some persons may consider as challenges like, you know, my age mm. or my gender. I don't believe when I walk into a room, I don't consider those things. I don't think anybody else should. I think you just need to look at persons heart, look at their ambition, uh, look at their willingness uh, to do the job and evaluate them on that. Mm. Now, you had to face off at any time with <coughs> persons when you had to had cause to represent that position? Of course. Um, you know, it's been challenging and it's, it's a blessing, right? Because I have to look back. Some of the persons I've been able to work with over the last few months uh, have been my principals, uh, mm. have been uh, my teachers, uh, have been my co-workers. And it's really humbling. I remember telling them one time when I was a bit hard on them, I said, you have to blame yourself. You had a <laughs> hand to play in my development. And they laughed, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a funny moment, but yet a serious one. And I said to them, you know, I'm grateful to have had the, pos the, the opportunity to be here, but I would not have been here had it not been uh, really significantly for the educators who would have played a significant role in my life that made me want to become an educator in the first place. And so I think there's a reality that, you know, when we get to sit in seats like this, uh, it really shows a legacy, it shows impact, not so much of me, but of the persons who would have contributed to the person that I am today. Okay, uh, we, we must talk about that, the, the scenario under which you became uh, the Minister for Education. We all would say, you know, God always know what he's doing, no matter what man say and what man try to do, whatever is to be, will be. But so be it, we must look at how would this happen? Yes. Uh, go back to, to the, it would be almost a year ago. Yes. Uh, it was April 28th, yes. April 28th or I believe so. 27th. Yes. Uh, when, when word would have gotten around, I think you were out on the sea trade as well. Yes. Uh, so you weren't here when the, the word broke. You no. weren't back just yet. Go back to that moment and, and, and what were you feeling in that moment when word broke that the premier of this territory, the person who was leading you uh, in government, was taken into custody in the United States? So it was, uh, it was an extremely uh, challenging and difficult moment. Uh, just thinking back at it, uh, it really uh, evokes some emotions that you, know, you try to keep in private. Um, but it was a challenging time because it was just unbelievable, right? It, it was unbelievable at the time. And I believe um, ultimately it was a moment of great, just great dismay um, for all involved and great disappointment and discouragement and really just anticipation of really trying to understand exactly what was taking place. But we didn't have the opportunity to stay in those feelings. Uh, our country, uh, our territory was at stake. And we swiftly had to get into gear and start to have some very serious conversations uh, to decide exactly how and when and why we would move forward um, as a collective and as a team. And I'm very, very appreciative of the team that we have because amidst the adversity, we were able to still lead. Um, of course, we had to do it in a very swift way. Um, that didn't allow for as much consultation as we would have hoped. Um, but of course, when you consider the timeline and when you consider the challenge that we were dealing with of suspension of our constitution, 
we had no choice but to kick into gear and do what we believe to be necessary, of course, um, upon the advice of, 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 of Parsons as well, uh, to really uh, negotiate. And I believe we were successful in doing that. And I, I don't think that any of us could give any credit to ourselves. It could have only been God uh, that would have you know, been our strength, that would have given us the wisdom, and that would have given us the guidance to be able to get through that difficult time. Are, are you still struggling to, to come to grips with, with what would have happened then? Uh, sometimes, sometimes. But I, there's a quote that I live by, right? Um, and it says, um, there's always opportunity in chaos. So we could, we could stay and live in the chaos, and that's not me trying to excuse anything. Uh, it's more so me saying that, you know, we have to move on and we have to figure it out. And I believe that this gave me an opportunity to do something that I've always wanted to do, something that I've dreamt of doing, someone that I've dreamt of being, which is the Minister of Education, Youth and Sports. And I believe as chaotic as it was, it was an opportunity for me to give of myself in a way that I desired to do so. And I'm just grateful that I had the chance to, you know, walk with some amazing individuals in the ministry and in the schools that really helped us to advance education uh, in the Virgin Islands. So I can't dwell on the difficulty of the moment. Uh, what I did then and what I'll do now is always seek to see what the opportunity is in this. And I'm grateful that I was given that chance to really uh, delve into some of the visions and some of the dreams that I had uh, that simultaneously and collectively uh, merged with that of other individuals in the sector and I believe we've been able to do a lot uh, to move Virgin Islands education full steam ahead. Uh, once in that position of Minister for Education, uh, what, were, what were some of the things that you went head on to deal with? Well you see the approach for me um, was different. I knew what I believed from my own personal experience being in the system needed to be done. But I know that there's a stigma attached uh, to, the, to the ministry of this top-down approach, mm. where you sit in the ministry and you make decisions and you create policies, but you don't include the people who are on the ground every single day, who in reality uh, know exactly how to fix some of the challenges that we have. And so one of the first things that I did, uh, we, we did meet the minister, meet the minister of education. And we had uh, stakeholder meetings with our primary, secondary teachers. Uh, we did it with uh, our special ed teachers, just, just about every sector, all the childhood, every sector we could think on. And we started to get feedback on exactly what we as a collective wanted the priorities of the Ministry of Education to be. And I remember saying to them very clearly, there may be 30 problems, I'm sure there's more than that. Mm. But in the next few months, we could only focus on three. What are your top three priorities that you want me and the ministry to focus on over the next three months? And we had some great discourse. Of course, there were so many different challenges, but we agreed and we focused in on three. Mm -hmm. Infrastructure, resources, and professional development. And I'm grateful uh, that through the support of the ministry, through the support of my colleagues, we were able to significantly, significantly advance those areas in a, in a very short space of time. Mm -hmm. It didn't come without challenges, though. Uh, mm -hmm. We had to go into standing finance, and we had to fight, and we had to push, because we believed that we needed additional funding. The, the funding complement for the Ministry of Education is not enough. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember you know, my PS coming in, and she was so valiant in saying, if you think education is expensive try, try ignorance. ignorance and we went in there and we fought really hard and we were able to get an additional 1.25 million dollars to be able to facilitate those very areas uh, some of them that the teachers and, and and principals and all of us would have agreed that we have to in this very moment move forward and advance Nikki and uh, is the money sufficient now of course it's not um, <laughs> it's it's not but it, it's more than we had right and that's why my campaign slogan is what it is right uh, it's give more get change and it's came from a quote i remember the summer institute the first time i really met all teachers in the same setting over 500 teachers public private uh, at the beginning of the school year and i had to speak to them and and i had this script and i just abandoned it because i didn't feel it was what i needed to say at the time and the quote that came and rang true to me was you can't get change if you give exact but if you give more, you get change. 
And as a poet, uh, you consider that metaphor. You go into a supermarket, you know you need change. You can't give the people the exact amount of money that you, you and, and expect to get change. Mm -hmm. You know, all teachers have been given of themselves, and we always ask them to give more. But the truth is, if we want change, we don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as educators, we don't have we don't have the ability, like some persons, to ignore things that are right in front of us. We have students coming to us every day, whether they're hungry, uh, whether they're in difficult situations at home, whether they're ch challenged academically, uh, whether they have special needs, whatever the situation is, and we don't have the opportunity to just ignore it. We have to be their champions. And I believe that through education, we have a vital opportunity if we fund it correctly to really realize our economic potential. You can't speak about economic diversification and economic opportunity without changing the education system. Mm -hmm. If we want the output in terms of the expertise on the back end, the system and the structure of our education system must change. That's why we have a mandate to reimagine education in the Virgin Islands. That's why we put additional funding in place uh, to be able to do a curriculum review. The curriculum has not been reviewed since 2007. Mm. I graduated from high school in 2007. Just think about that for a second and let it sink in. It tells me that the curriculum that we currently have is 15 to 20 years outdated. Mm. And the type of skill sets that we needed then, we're still producing now. So we have an overabundance of a specific and very small uh, group of skills and potential career paths versus us taking the opportunity and doing the hard work. Because curriculum review is hard work. But if we do it, we'll see the end result and the impact for years to come. And so my team, we've already started uh, moving in that direction. When you hear us talk about STEAM, it's new, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. And we believe that to be the tenants of what it will take to really see a shift and a change in the type of skill sets. We don't believe that grades is the outcome of education. We don't believe that. We believe that skills, skills is the outcome. Yeah. And skills is the new currency in the world. You could have a degree, you could have a diploma. Sometimes in this current world, it means nothing. Mm -hmm. But have some digital literacy skills. Mm -hmm. Understand the world that we live in, see the technological era that we live in, and ask yourself, are we preparing our young people for it? Not for the future. For the now, it's yes, already here. Yes. And so that's why we put in place STEAM. We've been doing Innovation Week. We, we instituted that um, in November. And we've introduced our young people to robotics, to coding, to programming, to artificial intelligence. You know, we have them playing chess. And believe it or not, as simple as you might think chess is, we in the ministry ourselves are completely surprised by how, many, how much of our students have taken a liking to chess. Oh, it's yes. not just a game. Mm -hmm. The kind of strategy that you must learn, the kind of critical thinking, thinking and problem yes. solving, those are skills that you will never lose and that it, they're transferable across content areas, across subject areas, and most importantly, into the workforce and even into your advancement in education. And while we do all of this, uh, you would have alluded to it uh, while, while you were talking about it, children with challenges, yes. children with special needs. And, you know, uh, it, it, it came to me as, as really one that I never thought of when I would have spoken with a, a previous uh, principal of the Elmo South High School recently right here on The Big Story when we talk about children with special needs and not only those who, who perform differently, but those who are high achievers yes. or, uh, or what we call overachievers, how, how, how we miss them how they miss uh, some of the attention that they also need what has the government done uh, in this period this four year period and more so during the the almost one year that you would have sat as as minister for education to tackle the needs of special uh, the, the the needs of children with, with with special needs so it has been a huge mandate of the, the, this current uh, administration and and my time in the ministry the, we do not have a special education policy in the Virgin Islands. As an academic, as an educator, I firmly believe in policy and legislation. I think you could have all the intentions in the world, you could want to create all the programming in the world, but if you don't have the policy and the legislation to support it, the change is very minimal and it's very present. It's not lifelong and it's not, it's not long lasting because it really depends on who is physically there, right? So you could just imagine, if you don't have a plan, the person who is actually initiating the current plan that they believe to be uh, the remedy, if something happens to them, if a government transitions, what happens? 
That is why policy and legislation has been a huge part of my mandate. And so the ministry is currently finalizing the special education uh, policy. We've had stakeholder consultations and we're seeking to ensure that we finalize that so that we could have a plan in place to really address special education. And as you said, special education is not just uh, young persons who have potential cognitive or physical disabilities or learning gaps due to those uh, scenarios. Special education also includes exceptionalities, the gifted and the talented. And to be very honest, even students with cognitive and physical disabilities, they do have exceptionalities in specific mm -hmm. areas. And if we don't have the capacity uh, to be able to identify, but not just identify, to be able to have the resources, the tangible manipulatives that would allow them to be able to learn in the way that they learn. Children do not learn the same. There are multiple type of learning styles. You have students who learn visually, they learn auditorily, uh, kinesthetically, which is hands-on, solitary, they want to be by themselves, uh, interpersonal, they'll walk in a group. And so as an educator, you have to really sit and decipher the type of learning style that your children have, and then you have to shift your instruction and have the manipulatives to be able to reach them in the way that they learn. And so we also, um, alongside working on the policy, put funds in the budget to purchase resources for special education. And so that has been a tremendous success, um, at least in seeking to begin to alleviate uh, the type of challenges that would come because children on a whole, and even children with special needs, they cannot learn anymore with just pen and paper, chalk and talk, it doesn't work, not in this current century. We have to give our students the technology, the manipulatives, the resources that they need to learn in the way that best suits their abilities. And so we've been working hard to do that, of course. Additionally, um, we're seeking to break ground on the Eslin Henley Roche Learning Center. We have faced some setback with that because the court, the magistrate's court, um, has still um, been resident there. Um, and very soon, as far as I understand, they should be moving into their new location and thus we'll be able to break ground there. And I believe having that infrastructure in place, plus the resources, plus we've been doing significant work with professional development for special education, we have a huge cohort of special ed teachers in the Virgin Islands. Yeah. And we're also, through professional development, allowing our general education teachers to have special education training. So even when our students integrate into the regular classroom, they have the ability to deal with them in a way that they should um, have access to. Okay, oh, the clock is winding down on our half hour that is allotted to us for this moment, but I want you to quickly, in summary, uh, speak to this concern that we've been hearing a lot. Oh, uh, Sheru is a young one inside there, and we thought that we would have seen her sparring around a lot more with the young people. We have not been seeing her as we thought that we respond to that. I understand the concern. It's a genuine concern, and I believe it's an understandable one. Uh, it's one that I can upfront apologize for um, because I believe the expectation of myself and even other individuals um, was one that was necessary. I think we also, though, have to pay keen attention to the systems and the structures that we have. And it's really, it really speaks to another point in education where we have to really have a conversation surrounding our governance and system structures or civic uh, literacy so that we as individuals through the education system could really understand how government functions, how the House of Assembly functions. And I believe that uh, the opportunities, unfortunately, in a lot of ways, and this is not an excuse, it's just the reality of how the system is, right, uh, did not present itself um, for access to a whole lot of opportunity. Um, however, um, I believe, you know, as disappointing as that was, um, we st I still kicked into gear as much as possible. Uh, I still sought to find opportunities to see how I could assist. Um, not having a specific portfolio in a lot of instances, in the current structure as I was trying to explain, oftentimes create some level of hindrance and barriers. Um, and there's even a discussion and conversation surrounding um, you know, potentially stepping into other people's areas based on appointments and those kind of things. And I think we have to have a very serious conversation holistically when we speak about appointments and assignments in government. Um, and I believe that we are a team. I believe we have to take on a team mindset. And I believe that we have to use uh, the strengths of all individuals on the entire team, despite what title we may have, 
um, to really be able to bring about the change. And I believe that that requires systematic change, though, because it shouldn't just take the individual will of persons on a team to be able to give each other a chance. Must I be believe there. there must be a system systematic uh, declaration of exactly structure, and structure mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. of how every single individual that the people have elected will have a say and will have an opportunity through their experience, through their expertise. And this is whether they sit on the government or the opposition. That, that, I, I don't believe that that should be a hindrance to all of us using our ability as Virgin Islanders, as people who have received so much from this territory, so much from the very system, we have to figure out how we get this system right so that we could all have the ability to give of ourselves in service to the people of these Virgin Islands. All right. Uh, uh, 10 seconds, 15 seconds to the people of the territory. Uh, to, to the people of the Virgin Islands, I want to say thank you so much for the opportunity to have served in the fourth House of Assembly. Uh, it has been an amazing time. It, it has been, yes, challenging, but the learning and the opportunities that have come out of it have truly made me a better individual. And I believe I'm in a much better place at this point uh, to be able to serve you uh, into the future. I would want to ask you uh, for your vote of confidence on the 20th and the 24th of April for myself and Team Virgin Islands Party. Uh, specifically, I want the opportunity to continue to bring about change in education, youth and sports because I believe our children deserve it. And I look forward to getting the opportunity uh, to be able to continue that change uh, into the Fifth House of Assembly. All the best to you, Honorable Sherry B. De Castro. I don't you. leave out that B. Yes. <laughs> and we wish you every success uh, going forward. And I want to thank you so much for joining us for this edition of The Big Story. I'm Kathy Richards.